All right, I guess, I guess we may as well begin if that's okay with everyone. I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, just kind of go like that for someone at the back. The fan's pretty loud, but I'll try to speak loudish. <laughs> uh, so thanks for coming along. Uh, if you haven't filled in your little name tag, please do, just so we can have easier conversations. Uh, I wanted to begin just with a bit of brief background about me, sort of my background, what I, how I'm approaching the particular topic tonight. I started off in sort of philosophy and psychology, wandered through and did a PhD in psychology, and then I spent a couple of years doing research in neurology, mostly brain stuff, brain zapping, brain imaging, things like that. Uh, and then I spent about four years out in the real world doing work running think tanks and innovation centers. Um, a lot of it around sort of the things we're going to talk about today, customer discovery, understanding how to get deeper insights into what your consumers might want, understanding technology and how it interfaces or interacts with customers, things like that. So I did that, that for about four or five years. And then I went off to the UK where I was for 13 years, a professor of consumer psychology and innovation, uh, doing lots of work on things like marketing, advertising, branding, brand development, social media, uh, helping sell chocolate for Cadbury and ice cream for Ben and Jerry's and things like that. And then for the last two years, almost three years now, I've been uh, back here in the US. I'm in Boston, where I uh, run the Human Factors Engineering Program at Tufts University, which is sort of the intersection of engineering, psychology, design, technology, computer science, things like that. Fun stuff. <laughs> uh, and so today, we're going to have a little session on sort of cons customer discovery and also a little bit on design thinking. And I've heard that some people have existing business concepts, that there was another idea boot camp that happened recently. But I'm just curious, raise your hand if you came here with an idea that you're really passionate about or have a pretty clear business plan or not business plan, but just business concept. No one. How interesting. I ran an earlier session and there were three people with them. So, okay, we'll start from scratch, which is cool, nice. Uh, no limitations, no constraints, we'll just dig right in. Uh, so, I wanted to begin with a simple question. Do people know why businesses fail? Why do most businesses fail? There's been lots of research on this. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, lack of money. Lack of money, that often does happen. They'll burn through the money, not have enough to go on. That is, I think that's number six in the top 10 or something like that. They run out of money, that's a good one. Any others? Yes, sir. They become less innovative than their competitor. Interesting. Uh, so that, that probably is often the case, or a, a new innovator comes in and out-innovates them, maybe. That's interesting. That's not the number one reason, but that's probably also in the top 10, I would guess. Yes, sir. They don't create value. They don't create value. Interesting. Abstract. I like it. Uh, yeah, that's probably up there. Again, it kind of depends how you think about it, but that's definitely a part of it. If they're not creating value, they're not going to be competitive. Yes. They don't target the right they don't target the right market. Now we're getting really close. That's kind of where I'm aiming for. Don't target the right market, create value, they, Matt. They come up with something and they think it's good, but no one wants it because they didn't ask. Yeah, same kind of thing. I think you guys are all zone, zooming in on the right space. They come up with some idea, which is kind of cool, interesting technology, cool concept maybe, but no one really wants it. So basically, they don't understand what consumers want. There's no real market need. There's no consumer or customer desire. And that's why most businesses fail. So then the question would be, so how can we avoid that kind of failure? Like if you have a new idea, if you're part of a team, if you and a friend come up with a cool idea, how can you be more likely to guarantee success, less likely to fail? Uh, and basically, from what was just said, you should guess that it's around understanding the consumer and designing things that actually appeal to your customers, let's say, customers, consumers. And one of the ways that people do that nowadays is by using a process called design thinking. Uh, I, I ran a boot camp on design thinking last year. Today I'm going to bring in some of that kind of conceptual space on design thinking, but also more focused specifically on assessing your customers, uh, building, understanding customer value, things like that. Raise your hand if you've done design thinking stuff before. Yay, design thinkers, okay. About a quarter of you, good, excellent. All right, so this will be a bit of a refresher for some, new stuff for others. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole design thinking process, but I'll go through the important parts, the fun parts. Can you still hear me okay? Okay, all right, so I'm gonna begin with a little video, a little example from design thinking. The Lucky Iron Fish. Raise your hand if you've seen this one before. I'm just kind of curious. Oh, 
Have you seen it? Did you see it? You were in my workshop last time, right? Okay. Is that where you saw it as well? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, most people haven't seen it, which is unfortunate because it's a really cool little project. See what you think. When I first moved to Cambodia, I lived in a rural village and it took a little bit of time before people got used to this sort of foreigner wandering around. Initially, I was here to search for a remedy to a problem. Anemia, caused by a lack of iron in the blood. It causes dizziness and weakness. It breeds complacency and lethargy. Kids can't concentrate in school. It also causes premature births and problems during pregnancy for women. Nearly two out of three children are anemic. But this piece of metal has the power to stop it all. My challenge was to find a way to supplement the typical Cambodian diet of fish and rice. I knew that iron pills and other iron treatments weren't really affordable by many people in the villages. Uh, in my search, I found that cooking in a cast iron pot can release iron into the food and that iron is then absorbed in the diet. But I realized that most Cambodian women use aluminum pots because they're cheaper and lighter. And then I got to thinking, what if I could get them to put this chunk of iron in their pot? It would be a simple, cheap and accessible treatment that even the remote villagers could use. But my simple solution had one big problem. I found that the women were hesitant to add this sort of ugly piece of iron into their pots. I found that the iron blocks came in very useful, but just not in the pots. And so I realized I had to dig a little bit deeper. I searched for everything. I looked at sayings and beliefs. I looked at rituals. Anything that would give me a better understanding of Cambodian culture. And then I landed this. A symbol of good luck. I um, was a little bit shocked when I when I found out how uh, positive the findings were. In the test areas, anemia has pretty much disappeared altogether, which is absolutely astounding. It's, it was far exceeded what we had expected. We're hoping that this little fish holds the key to treating anemia across the region and beyond. It's definitely one lucky fish. Pretty cool, nice little story, Lucky Iron Fish. Uh, it's a great story, it's a nice success story. They have been able to distribute hundreds of thousands of these little iron fish now. They set it up as a social enterprise. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty nice story. But it's also, from my perspective, a really good example of design thinking in action, so to speak. So if you think about the way design thinking works and what we're gonna do tonight, basically you identify some kind of a problem or some kind of pain, some kind of consumer need, if you will. In this case, it was an actual medical problem, anemia, right? So that was the problem. And the root of it was lack of iron. So then in the next stage of design thinking, you go and understand how your consumers, what, what they're like and how they live their lives. So what they do, what they fear, what they want, what their dreams are, what they're afraid of, you know, how they, uh, go about their daily journeys, if you will. You understand all of that, and then the thing you're supposed to do after that is come up with an idea, an initial concept, a prototype, if you will. And in this case, his initial concept was just a piece of iron that he could try to get them, and it didn't work. He went out and he tested it in the context and found that it wasn't quite right, that he needed to modify it a bit, and it was after that modification that he came up with the lucky iron fish. So it's, a, it's a, a nice encapsulated example of all the different stages that you need to go through to kind of use design thinking to come up with a new idea, to refine it and to iterate it. So that's what we're gonna work on tonight. Uh, there's lots of different models of design thinking. This is the Stanford model. It sort of begins where you empathize, you go out and get a feeling for the environment, what people care about. You define some kind of set of constraints or goals or aspirations, if you will. You think about possible ways of doing that. You build a prototype like the block of iron, you test it, and then you kind of cycle through again. So after you've 
you go out and test it, you find that that didn't work, and so you begin and you empathize again. So you didn't like the iron fish, uh, the iron block, what about a fish, for instance? And you go around and around. And that's kind of what we're gonna work on a bit today, but we're gonna focus mostly on these earlier stages. So, uh, like I said, there's lots of different models. That was one. Here's three or four other different models. This is the Stanford model again, sort of the different stages. There's, there's various others. They all have sort of the idea at the beginning, you sort of understand your consumer, you understand the context, their life journeys, things like that. So being an academic, I had to have my own model. So for me, I have this, this model, the climber model it's called. Um, partly, I like it because I can remember the different stages. Like I've taught classes with the Stanford model a bunch and I can never remember what the order of things are. So here at least I can remember the order because it's a word. So, you know, you start by understanding who your customer is, what they're like, how they lead their life. Then you have some insight. There's a whole phase around generating insights. You come up with an idea for a mechanism. So it might be a block of iron. Uh, you build it, you make the block. You evaluate it with your consumers, see if it works, and then you kind of repeat the process. So that's my version of the kind of design thinking process. And we're gonna today, tonight, we're gonna go through the beginnings of it. We're gonna mostly focus on understanding who our customers are and how they lead their life. Does that make sense? It's supposed to be the customer discovery bootcamp. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, so in general, this climber model is a nice way, well, any design thinking model is a nice way to sort of understand an, a group of users, identify an opportunity and kind of build something. Uh, but I also wanted to touch on at least briefly sort of Steve Blank's uh, customer development model and the da, 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 business model canvas. I think that that's what's being used here. I don't know if you've used that in other things here. No one. I was told you guys would have coming in with ideas that you've had experience with this, but that's fine if you haven't, all the better, because I'm not a huge fan of this. But anyway, it's a good model. It works really well if you, once you have an idea and you start assembling the pieces, then you can put together who's, who will your partners be, you know, what's your value proposition, what's different segments might you have, all that kind of stuff. The nice thing about the design thinking approach is that you sort of can use that to generate an initial insight to put together a first like bit of this model, and then you can, continually use it to sort of zoom in, for instance, on what your value proposition is by understanding more about who your consumers are or what partners you might want by understanding what matters to your consumers. So anyway, we're gonna sort of focus on both of them, but more on the design thinking first stages. That's the plan. And it's gonna be interactive. You guys are gonna to have to get to work very shortly. So um, like I said, the, the standard uh, customer discovery method has you go through and first state your hypotheses, who are your customers, how are you gonna distribute your model, this, distribute your product or service. This is all basically stages for building up this. Tonight, we're not gonna go through all those different stages. We're mostly just gonna focus on the customers, who are your customers and what are they like? And we're gonna talk about how you might test your hypotheses about your customers. All right, any questions about any of that? Can you still hear me? <laughs> okay, great. All right, so we'll start with the customers. That's where I think you should always begin. Uh, you always wanna start with who your customers are. Um, and often just by trying to dig in and understand your customers or your consumers, you can get new insights and innovations. And I have a little example here from one of my uh, past master's students who went and worked for this company. Uh, it's a nice example because back in the, let's say 2000s, they decided that there was a, potential for disruption in the baby food industry, which is a you know billion dollar industry. And to do this disruption, what they did was sort of unusual. They went and spent hundreds of hours chatting with parents about feeding babies. And back then, when you were, when you were feeding a baby, you always had these little glass jars of baby food. And it was a pain because you'd have to carry them around in your bag. When you wanted to feed the baby, you would need to have a spoon. So you could open the jar, feed the baby, and at the end you were stuck with this heavy glass jar. So it's not a very good process if you try to understand the consumer and for instance, how they lead their life. So if you talk to the caretaker, often the mom, uh, she would complain that if they wanted to go to the park, she had to bring you know, two of these little glass jars and sometimes they would break and stuff. So by understanding who the customer was, and in this case, it's not the baby, it's the parent, the customer and their lifestyle, you actually could come up with something new. And this is what they invented. Now it's kind of the standard for baby food, but you, it was the first time they invented these little al aluminum-ish bags, these little plastic, where's your, have you seen those? They have them, yeah, everyone's, everyone knows these things. And they were pretty cool because not only were they light, 
and thin. You could easily throw them in a bag. They weren't breakable, so that was nice. But also, you didn't need a spoon. You could just twist it off and squeeze it right into the baby's mouth. Um, and at the end, you just had this empty little pouch that was easy to throw away or carry around or whatever. So it was a pretty massive innovation. And even their websites, their branding, everything about their site and product and existence was defined by talking to their customers. So it's a, it's a pretty good example of how you can come up with something radically different just by studying your customers and how they lead their life. Uh, and it was very successful. It's now one of the largest baby food companies in the world, although it was bought by Gerber, I think so. Absorbed by a giant baby. So start with the customers. Let's say uh, that's where we want to begin. We want to start with our customers. So the question for all of you is who are your customers? Uh, and there's lots of different possible groups you might want to focus on. Kids, millennials, Gen Z, uh, aging people, the young again population. These are hugely growing groups. If anyone's interested in a future safe career, become an expert on marketing to the elderly. Elderly, is that the PC term? I'm not sure. Anyway, if you can figure out about marketing to that group, that's a hugely growing population all kinds of opportunities there. So it's an interesting one to think about. So at this point, you guys are gonna to have to pick some customer group at your table. Uh, and I guess the table, the numbers aren't entirely even, but they're not radically uneven. I guess we could stick with this. Six is kind of a big number back there. But okay, that's, we're good enough, four, five, six. So customers, basically, I'm gonna leave it up to you and your table to come up with an interesting customer group. Now, if you're interested in some kind of technology or some kind of problem in the world. So maybe it's uh, plastic in the seas or the lack of political engagement, students don't vote or people don't vote in general. Or if you're interested in some apps, technology, uh, whatever it is, that's fine. You could think about that too in your little group. But what I want you to do now is to come up with someone who could be an interesting customer. So for instance, in the earlier session at lunchtime, I ran one of these and there was a group that was interested in sort of students living in on campus housing, I guess. And they came up with some pretty cool ideas. They actually came up with a new business idea. I think it might actually work. But anyway, um, that was just because they decided to focus on one group. That's the nice thing about design thinking is it's kind of it's not easy, but it's not super hard. You don't actually have to do a lot of work to come up with some cool ideas later. You should test them, of course, and refine them and stuff. But at least in the first instance, I'm hoping every table comes up with at least one cool idea. So we'll see what we can do. So what we're going to do is talk about a different, to pick a customer group and ideally identify some specific subtypes. So uh, let's see, break up into groups, three segments. So it could be, for instance, let's say in the um, baby food group or baby food example, in their case, they actually, you could choose the babies as one consumer, the parents as another, and let's say two kinds of parents. Maybe there are the kind of organic food, wanting healthy foods for their baby kind of parents. Then there's the on the go parents. So that's fine. That's three segments. Uh, or you could come up with three different kinds of babies. There's the colicky babies, the finicky babies, and the kind of sporty babies. I don't know. I'm making up random stuff. Or parents, different kinds of parents, the kind of first child, very worried about the baby, their, you know, second, fourth child, whatever it is. So come up with three segments. For each segment, I want you to try to kind of enrich it, make it as, as robust as possible. So for instance, come up with a name for it. So it might be uh, the persona like Student Susan. She lives in on-campus housing. She does, she goes to the gym all the time, you know, whatever it is. Just kind of make up a bit of a story. I know that it's going to be based just on stereotypes, assumptions. That's fine. That's okay. In a way, that's another nice thing about design thinking. It doesn't matter. We're later going to enrich it more and validate things and verify them. But for now, just come up with some rough ones. So take about seven minutes. I'll set a little timer up here to come up with three segments with a couple of bullet points describing each of the segments. Any questions about that? Does that sound okay? All right, go, seven minutes. Good work. So I went around and spoke to most groups. It sounds like everyone is doing a great job of coming up with three different flavors of customers or something like that, which is good, awesome. I'm gonna have a share in a minute, but before we do, that was part, part one of this first activity. Part two is now to choose one of those 
flavors of groups that you were thinking about and to kind of dig into them a little bit more, right? So to, to say, there we go. So what are they like? How do they spend their time and money? Uh, what are their demographics? What are their, the, the, the ones that I think are most important or interesting are sort of what I call the flat. It's part of my whole climber metaphor. Sorry, it gets tortured and awkward. But anyway, at the, if you're gonna climb, you start off on the flats and then later you're gonna get to the ramp and then the base, but we won't go through them all. But for now, just think about what are their fears, loves, aspirations, and traits. Like, what are they worried about in life? Are they worried that if, if you are a retired couple and you're finally an empty nester, are you worried that life is passing you by and you don't wanna miss this chance while you're still young, healthy, relatively wealthy to go and grab life or something? So what's your big fear? What are their loves? What motivates them? Why do they get out of bed in the morning if your kid's wanting to go to our art school. I don't know. I have no idea what you guys are up to. Whatever it is, what do they love about it? What, what do they value in their life? What are their dreams, aspirations? Where do they want to be three years from now? So just spend maybe five more minutes picking one of the groups that you th were thinking about and think about kind of what makes them tick, what motivates them. Uh, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so five minutes coming up with motivations, drives, desires, fears, loves, aspirations. Go! You had another 30 seconds or a minute, but I took it away because I figured you, it sounds like everyone's making good progress. So that was the first phase of kind of design thinking is to identify a consumer or a customer and start to fill in some of their basic properties, what motivates them and stuff. The next phase is life. And it's very similar. It's linked in a weird way. Some models of design thinking, in fact, don't separate them out. I think it's important to keep them a little bit separate to first really think about what's the customer like as an individual and then to think about how they spend their time. So the life phase is sort of understanding the life, the concerns, dreams, aspirations, like we sort of were just saying, uh, oh, I have an example. So yeah, this is a simple example. I'll just go through it very briefly. Uh, this was a bank in the Pacific Northwest. They realized that they're, they really wanted to focus on millennials, how to get more millennials to open up new bank accounts. It's a growing population. They spent time thinking about them, them, millennials as consumers or customers. What do they like? What are their fears? What are their aspirations? Uh, what do they love to do? Where do they spend their time? And they started thinking about their life. Where do the millennials spend their time? How do they spend their time? And they realized that they spend their time in coffee shops, a lot of them. Uh, and so they made banks that basically looked like coffee shops, not to lure them in and trap them, but just as places that millennials would want to hang out naturally. Uh, and so this is one of their banks that they opened. This is one of the kind of banks opened by Umqua in more of an urban center. So they opened them all over. So this first one was sort of in a downtown fancy part of town. This is kind of more of an urban grunge. And these are all banks. They're not coffee shops. They are just banks. And as you're sitting there, some banky person, banksy person will come up to you and start talking to you about, they won't sell you insurance or anything, but they'll, if you have a question, they kind of come and chat with you about it. Uh, here's another one, sort of almost like an Apple store meets a bank meets a Starbucks or something. Uh, and here's another one very much like an Apple Genius Bar banking kind of experience. And it's pretty cute because they were able to come up with this cool idea just based on understanding how their target consumers live their life. Uh, and it was successful. They wanted to get 10 million in new business. They ended up capturing over 50 million in new business. So that's pretty good. Uh, very successful. And actually this, oh yes, Umpqua. I don't know if that's how it's spelled. U-M-P-Q-U-A, yes. Oh no, these guys were 10 years before Chase. And then along comes Capital One and Chase. There's a bunch of others that recently in the last three or four years, uh, the Umpqua was in, I think that was, 2004. Oh, well, this this report was from 2003. Surf sip, so pretty early, long time ago, 17 years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah. So now, just in the last two or three years, other banks have caught on, and I like that. Capital One. They talk to. They say, "Welcome to banking reimagined." It should really be banking stolen from other people because they didn't come up with the idea at all, but they stole it, and it's, it works well. They've teamed up with Pete's Coffee, so there's a bunch of these around now. Like in Boston, there's a, a few of these Capital One cafes. They're called, um, and it, and they are very much like the other example, 
uh, that I talked about. They really are lifestyle cafes where people come around and offer you financial advice. Um, I'll show you. It's a bit of a propaganda video because it was made by Capital One, but it gives you a better feeling for what the whole place is like. So here we go. My job is just talking to people all day, just having genuine conversations about whatever it is that customer is looking to talk about, whether it's about money or whether it's about coffee. It's, it's there if you need it. We were just at the farmer's market and saw the Capital One Cafe. It feels easier to approach someone and actually like ask them questions. Money is one of the most stressful situations for families, for individuals. So this is a space where they can come in and reduce that stress entirely. It's kind of a personal touch. Just really a cool place to be I work at a bank, but it's it's not a regular bank. Like We're not like a regular bank, we're a cool bank. We got the crew working the coffee bar right there. Meeting they're people, they're people they're having they're interaction with them making friends along the way. I really love that. I know deep down in my heart that no matter who walks into this space, they'll get something out of it. It's a space where customers can utilize and make it, make it their own. We are changing the way that people bank. We're changing the way people feel about finance. We're changing the way people feel about money. To be able to educate customers in a less stressful environment is an opportunity that I cherish every single day. So there you go. It's a bit of a, like I said, a propaganda video. It makes you want to go work at one of those places or something. But uh, it's a pretty good example of, of how just by understanding how a specific customer or consumer lives their life, you can come up with whole new kind of innovative ideas. So in this phase, which I'm only gonna do for maybe three or four minutes, because from overhearing the conversations, a lot of you have already been doing this a bit, I want you to think about how could you empathize with this, this particular customer you have? Like, how do they spend their time? So, and you don't wanna solve their problems, you just wanna kind of document their journey. So in this phase, the things you wanna really focus on are sort of their relations. So you have a person, but now you need to understand who else is important in their world. So if it's a mom, like an over attentive mom, I guess is what you guys sort of have, you know, who else, who are the other players? How does she spend her day? Document some of the journeys that the people go on, All right? So in an average day, how do they wake up? How do they do what it is they do? So document sort of their relations, their journeys, their activities. And again, just spend five minutes thinking about what those things might be and not necessarily extraordinary journeys and activities like you guys are working on tourist folk or tourism not tourism but uh anyway you don't need to think about their activities in your specific domain like sports or whatever it is more just like ordinary activities partly this will inform marketing campaigns as well how could you where could you talk to them how could you talk to them if that makes sense so think a bit about activities journeys and relationships go Going around the room, it sounds like you guys have come up with some really cool insights. You're getting there. All kinds of interesting things are percolating. Uh, so, uh, like I said, there's there's two, this is actually kind of two classes weirdly fused into one. So it's both a design thinking class, which you guys have been doing a great job on. Nice work. Uh, and I think there's been some cool ideas that are coming out of it all. Uh, and it's also supposed to be talking about the customer discovery process. So you've already done a lot of kind of customer discovery here, but a lot of that is just based on your own internal ideas and assumptions and stereotypes. And again, all that's fine. It's, it's okay because it, it has been moving your thinking forward. One point I wanted to make about this, by the way, is that if you're trying to come up with a good idea, even though it sounds counterintuitive, you often will be much better off by picking one narrow segment and really kind of digging down in that one segment. So let's say if you want to make, uh, if you wanted to de design Uber before Uber came into existence, my advice to the Uber person would have been, don't think about what people in general want, think about what this little old lady carrying her luggage home from the airport would need in finding transportation, right? And not because they should design something for her with her bags and not knowing the city and stuff, but just because by following one specific individual, you could start to uncover real human needs. And then you can, if you do that with another one, okay, so let's say it's a mom with a kid coming back from a park or it's uh, a business person who's just spending the day in 
London or whatever it is, you could, if you trace them as a customer and trace their life journeys, you could start to make insights and discoveries for real basic needs. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get you to do here is to dig in deeper and deeper. And it seems silly because in the end, you're going to be designing a service for, you know, uh, semi-pro student Steve who has no time and does whatever it is. And it seems a bit ridiculous because you're not going to actually make a service for semi-pro Steve or whatever it is. Uh, but in the end, you're going to come up with some pretty cool insights about the kinds of needs that he has. And then you might go through another semi-pro kind of person and eventually you'll discover some deep need. So I know that makes sense, but that's, that's the plan. Uh, and so we've done this, the customer and lifestyle just here on paper and chatting amongst ourselves. In the business kind of uh, customer discovery model, business canvas kind of thing, you do the same type of stuff, not just for your customers, but also for how you're going to distribute your product or price your product, etc. It's really no different. So when you look at that big business plan thing and it has all those empty boxes, they look scary, they look intimidating, but you can actually follow the same process for each of those boxes. And you know, here in less than an hour, you've been able to kind of come up with some good insights for the customer. It wouldn't take that much time to start thinking about these other areas as well. So again, for today, just as kind of an exercise and to get you used to how you do this kind of process, we're gonna just skip the others. We're gonna stay on customers and we're gonna dig into now, how could you, now that you have some basic ideas, how could you go out and get more actual data, more insights to kind of enrich your ideas of the customers. All right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of different tools you might want to use. So now that you actually, each of you, each table has some customer segment that they're sort of interested in, what next, right? So you have some ideas, you should go out and try to validate them. You should go out and try to enrich them. And I'm going to talk about five different ways you might want to go do that. Uh, and the first one is just observation, right? So the way it works, let's say you're trying to make a new uh, next generation hubway bike, bike rental kind of thing. An easy way to get insights is just to go there and watch people renting bikes. Look at how they do it, see what they do. Or if you're in the digital world and you're on a website, you could just do sort of click stream analysis and see how actually people do interact with it. All of those are just forms of observation. And it sounds easy, but actually to do it well is a little difficult because what you want to do is you first want to go out and do informal observations. Right, so you go and watch, just hang out around the bike rental zone and see what people are doing and make little notes, maybe write down stuff. And after a while, you'll start to see recurring patterns. People do the same kind of stuff, like uh, they get stuck on the paying screen or they can't figure out where the bike ID number is or they can't locate, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, what you, after your informal observations and you note these things down, you then put together a formal observation checklist. So, you know, did they, were they successful in creating an account for the bike rental system? Were they successful in making payment? Did they actually uh, buy the one month version or the one day version, things like that. And then after you have your observation checklist, ideally you should refine it, like try it out on someone when they're going to do it and see if you manage to capture all the details. And then you go out and you actually can use your observation checklist on say 10, 15, 20 different people renting a bike. And the nice thing about that is then you're not just ending up with a whole bunch of pages of little random notes. You're actually going to have some quantified data. You could do statistics. You could say, you know, 82% of people actually choose the one week option instead of the one month option. And that's a good opportunity for the Hubway company if they made it easier or if they offered something to kind of upsell people to the one month version, then we'd have something. So by doing this kind of informal and then formal, you get both qualitative and quantitative data, right? So you get observe stuff informally, get lots of like little anecdotes, like this uh, dad with his son, you know, kept trying to do this. And that's great. That's qualitative stuff is really good for stories, but you can also have statistics, right? And 82% of the people, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? So what I want you to do now is for each of you, you each have something like a target customer. If you had to go observe them, if I was going to say, okay, I want you to go and just for an in-class exercise, or if I run these things as like one week long boot camps, I would now say between now and tomorrow morning, you have to go and observe 10 of your, 20 of your customers. The question for you all is where would you find them? And sort of roughly what would you observe if you wanted to observe them? Observe them. 
Does that make sense? This thing's too loud. Uh, so only spend, let's say, three minutes, three minutes coming up with a couple of places. Come up with at least three places that you could go to observe these people in their natural habitat. I'm gonna stop you there. I'm just curious. We, may, we haven't been sharing amongst the table. So let's try, I don't know, you guys want to say just very briefly what your group was that you're focused on, a couple of their traits, and where you might observe them in the wild? <laughs> um, yeah, so we chose um, high school student athletes, um, particularly seniors in high school that are looking to play sport in college. Um, and not necessarily people that want to go pro, but people that just want to play sport in college, either to have um, some of their school paid for, or just because they love playing that sport. Um, and so places, uh, places we find them. Yeah, where would you go and observe them or um, track them? See them in the classroom. Yeah, on the classroom. classroom on the nice. Field, uh, on the field, in the, in the gym. Room. Cool. And uh, would you observe them as high school students or as college students or we both? Decided on, we decided on high school seniors. High school, high school seniors. Yeah. Cool. So uh, sounds good. That sounds good. All right. Good. Excellent. Any questions for them? High school seniors, no? All right, cool. All right, excellent. So that was, that's one, one technique you might use to start enriching your understanding of your customers. I have you guys go next, but well, let's, let's move to the next technique. So that's one, is observations, right? So you observe these people, again, start informal, ideally then get a bit formal and structured so you can actually do a systematic checking and then add things up and talk about how frequently and stuff. That's great. The next technique is to use interviews. Yay, interviews. Interviews are very, very useful. Uh, a lot of design thinkers just do lots of interviewing. Uh, storytelling, can you tell me about a time when, for instance. Uh, and, and for interviews, it's a bit of an art again. It's not just like you sit down and start chatting with someone because you should have thought about it a bit beforehand. Uh, you want to, first thing you do is that you assemble a range of topics, like what kinds of issues do you want to explore with your interviewees? So with your high school students, if I could get you a high school person who wants to go, a high school senior who wants to go semi-pro, and you had a half hour to chat with them, what topics might you want to explore with them? Uh, and so the first thing you should do is come up with a list of topics, and it's not specific questions. You'll come up with questions maybe later, or when you're doing questionnaire design, we'll talk about that a bit later as well. But for an interview, it's more like topics. So if you could have a half hour with your target person, what topics would you explore? And that's the activity. Two minutes, three minutes maybe, I'll be generous. Three minutes coming up with a list of, let's say eight different topics you might want to explore with them, right? And you could have subtopics, yeah? And actually, sorry, I'll add one other additional thing. Uh, it's, it's often good, and this will come up again later, to have sort of a broad area and then a specific smaller area underneath it. So like, uh, you know, how do you spend your free time? Uh, in your free time, do you often do sporty stuff? So you may want to have a broad area and then a, a slightly narrower area as well. So see if you can come up with like eight, either big areas or sub areas. <music> Cut us off there. It sounds like people are making good progress. Uh, so we talked about observation as a technique for understanding your consumers. We talked about interviews as a way, right? So here the idea is you, you have some topics, everyone's come up with some topics, you would then go down one layer deeper and maybe come up with sub areas that you'd want to explore. And then from that, you would develop an interview guide. So, you know, you begin with asking them about how they spend their spare time and then ask them how they, what kinds of uh, friends, what they do socially, maybe attitudes towards money, things like that. So after you've developed an interview guide, you could then go out and start interviewing people, right? And we'll talk a bit more in a minute about what you do with that. But uh, the next one I wanted to mention is a strange one more strange just from its name than anything else. It's called contextual inquiry, technically. Uh, and it's kind of a combination of observation and interview. And it sounds fancier than it is, uh, but I'll give you a little example. So this last summer, I was doing a project for a company that makes a new luggage screening device. It's, uh, it's at Logan Airport now. It's pretty cool. Instead of just doing an X-ray scan, it actually does sort of a spinning X-ray CT scan. And in the end, you get these 
3D bag scan. So you can rotate the bags and zoom in, zoom out, slice them and stuff, which is really cool. Uh, but one of the things that they wanted to know was, is there a better set of controls that they could give the people to let them zoom and rotate and stuff? And so we used this technique called contextual inquiry. And basically, we just went and watched luggage screeners using their device. And we would ask them, oh, I see you just zoomed in on that. What were you looking for? Or I see you're slicing now from the top. Is there a reason you chose to do it that way? Or if you're contextual inquiry and you're trying to talk to uh, uh, someone who's cooking food, you would say, oh, I see you crack the eggs on the counter, not the side of the bowl. Can you tell me why you chose to do that? So it's kind of a nice technique because it lets you observe behaviors and understand what they do, but it also lets you try to understand why they're doing what they're doing. So back to the Uber example, you know, if you were watching someone uh, trying to catch a taxi in New York City, you say, you know, I see you're looking up the street and kind of half waving. Why are you doing that? Or, you know, you're talking to the taxi driver, trying to figure out if they know where you're going. Why? Why is that important? That was, that's a bad example, but that's the idea of contextual inquiry. So if you talk to someone who is um, in your target group, you might watch them doing one of their activities and start asking them annoying questions. Uh, so again, I'm not going to have you do it, but you could think again, the question could be like, where would you do this and what kinds of questions would you ask them? So if, it could be that you're watching, let's say you get a high school senior and you have them sit down at a computer and you ask them to, you give them a website with uh, acts with lots of information on lots of different university choices and you ask them to just kind of go through and find a university that they think looks really like their dream university. You could see that, okay, they started, they searched for something. You could ask them, okay, I see you just searched for West Coast. Why is that? Or I see you searched for sports programs. You know, I see you searched for tennis or something. Uh, so you could start to kind of observe what they're doing and interview them at the same time. And it actually works surprisingly well. You can start to really uncover their motivations for making their decisions. Any questions about that? Contextual inquiry? Make sense? All right, so then of course we have focus groups. Focus groups are really popular. Most people have, if not been in one, have seen them, at least on TV. Uh, and it, it's very much like the interview approach. You wanna think about what topic. So you don't wanna come up with a list of questions for your focus group. You wanna start big picture. It's almost the opposite that I was saying before that you wanna start with a very specific customer here you want to start with a very broad topic. So you don't want to come up with the questions you'll ask them. You want to come up with the topic areas you'll explore with them. Uh, and then later, you often want to make a moderator guide, which tends to be topic area and maybe one or two prompting questions that you could choose from. But again, you want to think big picture. What kinds of information do we want to get? How, what do we want to do to help validate our assumptions about our customers? What kinds of questions are most critical for us to decide go, no go? Like if someone's going to invest a million dollars in your company idea, what data do you want to get from your focus group to support the investment? Does that make sense? All right, focus groups. Uh, and then we get to questionnaires and surveys, which are kind of the most common, most popular, easiest in a sense to do. Uh, and again, just like the other ones, you want to start with topic areas. What are the main things I want to explore? But then you want to come up with questions. And I wanted to just say a few things about the kinds of questions that you should be creating and the kinds of things you should consider. And here we go, lots of bullet point things. <laughs> Write them down, keep them in mind. If you're going to be making a questionnaire for this project or for whatever, be sure that you follow these kinds of things. So. You want to be sure that your questions are very simple. Use simple, clear words. You don't want to use $10 words, as they say. You want to use 50 cent words. No jargon, no vagueness. Uh, be sure that each, each of your survey questions or questionnaire questions is just about one specific topic. So it's not, you don't want to say, uh, where, where is your favorite place to go to buy food and wine? Because then when they say, Trader Joe's, for instance, I heard you guys say, it. I love Trader Joe's, uh, but then you don't know if it's the wine or the food. Actually, do they do wine at Trader Joe's here? They do. They do yeah. Uh, so, but you wouldn't know. So you may want to split that up into two separate questions, right? So, so you, in general, you want to just explore one concept with each question. So otherwise, later, it's going to be hard to know what you're finding out. <clears throat> the next thing is consider the question order. So there's been lots of studies showing that uh, depending on the order you ask questions in, you could have totally different results. So if you want to find out about someone's thoughts, some of the, some of the classic examples, so they want to look at how uh, people's political, what political attitudes people have. And if you begin by asking 
Are you interested in politics? Yes, no. Uh, thinking back on political activities recently, blah, blah. Then you could ask a specific political question. If you swap the order, you first ask just the very specific political question, you'll get a very different response because people weren't sort of conceptually in that political mind space. So think about the order you ask things in. In general, it's going to be true for almost all of these. You want to aim for this kind of a, a structure, what I call a funnel structure. So start broad. So it might be, you know, how do you like to spend your free time? If you're, uh, then you may want to ask, okay, do you do things in your free time with friends? And then when you think about organized sports, do you, are you interested in organized sports? So asking, start, starting at the broad and getting more and more narrow tends to work much better than the other way around. So you don't want to just say, do you do organized sports? because you might miss something. So you may want to start kind of more broadly. How do you spend your spare time? Any questions about that? Does that make sense? So question order is important. Start broad and get more and more narrow. Keep your reference periods short. So I have students back in Boston who are designing a new um, inhaler for kids, uh, for asthma, asthma inhaler, asthma inhaler. Uh, and you don't want to say, uh, let's say how in the last year, how many times have you used your inhaler? Because most people can't remember the last year. But if you say in the last week, how many times have you used your inhaler? Uh, and then the next question might be, how representative is that last week? Like, is that a normal week or is that, was that more or less than average? Uh, so it makes it much easier for people to kind of give you what you want to know. So yeah, keep your reference periods short. Um, Provide prompts and pictures if you're going to be asking about specific activities, products, services, loves, hates. You may want to show little pictures of things. Nowadays, you know, printing presses are cheap, <laughs> uh, if you're, especially if you're doing it online. You can include pictures to make it much easier. Prompt people. People often have trouble recalling, uh, for instance, some of the classic ones are if you ask about toothpaste, what toothpaste ads have you seen recently? Everyone will say Crest toothpaste because it's kind of the easiest to remember. But if you show frames from different ads, did you see this ad? Did you see this ad? Did you see this ad? You'll get much better responses. You'll get more truth from that. <clears throat> uh, reduce effort needed, of course. So you don't want to make it an incredibly difficult survey or questionnaire. Uh, avoid bias. So you don't necessarily want to say, how great would it be if we had a club for board games after school or something? Uh, provide a context. Again, this is related to this funnel shape thing. So if you're going to be asking about uh, empty nester experience wine club, I don't know. Ooh, wine and food club for empty nesters. There we go. That might be kind of cool. Anyway, whatever it is, you don't want to say how cool would it be if instead you may want to kind of avoid bias and give a few different options. Please rate how interested you might be in each of the following. Uh, and it just included as one of the options for them to rate and funnel. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions about the questions? No questions about the questions. So I would like you to try just for five minutes again. You, you already came up with sort of topic areas that you might want to explore. Come up with just maybe pick one of your topic areas and come up with three or four questions that you think sort of follows some of these and might be interesting to ask. So basically we're starting to put together a questionnaire that you could give to your target customers. Yeah. So come up with three or four questions in one of the topic areas you chose. Yeah, three or four questions in a topic. Time is up. Time is up. All right, so good job. I went around and t checked in with most of you. There's some good questions being developed there. Nice job, nice job. Does it seem doable, manageable, too hard, too easy? You can come up with questions. Good work. Uh, and again, if, if uh, you have to make a questionnaire at some point, try to keep all those things in mind. Try to start broad and get more and more narrow. Uh, now, I'm kind of jumping a little bit. I've skipped these two steps, but I think it's important we start thinking about the later phases because this is all about uh, customer discovery, validation, etc. So we spent time thinking about customers. You guys did great work on that. You thought about their life. Good job there as well. We didn't really come up with a new business idea per se, although each of you is kind of pretty close, I, I feel, to having an idea for something that could be kind of interesting to explore further. So 
if you come up with an idea for a business and you come up with some mechanism, like maybe it's a website, maybe it's a physical thing, whatever it is, that's what mechanism's all about. The next thing that you have to think about is actually building it, right? So, oops, sorry, ignore that. <clears throat> so building it, whether, sorry, whether you're doing design thinking or whether you're doing kind of the business plan canvas kind of thing, you, after you've understood your customer and all these other things, you then want to test your hypotheses to see if it's right. Questionnaires, observations, focus groups, all of those are some ways of testing. But often the, all of that leads up to the idea of testing your product concept. So let's say you do come up with an idea for something for the uh, empty nesters or for the high school students or whatever, whatever category you're looking at. You then want to actually test the concept. And this is related to kind of the idea of prototypes. So here's prototypes. If you're an architect and you're going to build a big house, you first build a little prototype so you can show it to the person and they can say, oh, I hate the look of that porch or that this pillar is just horrible. All right, you need to have a physical thing to look at so that you can get feedback on it and so you can kind of make it better. And that's the next stage of both the design thinking process and also this kind of customer discovery process. Here's an example of a prototype from an app development. In app development, a lot of my students are doing work developing apps, user interfaces, user experiences, and they build paper prototypes where you actually have, okay, if you clicked this, then this, you flip the page, this is what you would see. Now what would you click, for instance? Or you could sketch a little interface. Here's what it would look like, where would you click? And there's nice software out there that lets you actually go both from sketches to real stuff or just to use mid-level stuff and kind of it simulates that when you click. It's almost like a PowerPoint. You click here, it goes to the next slide. Uh, so there's lots of different ways you could do that. And all of these are just with the basic idea that you need a prototype to get feedback on. So it might just be in your case, for instance, it might be a story or a story board, a little cartoonified thing. Imagine you're in the sky and you come into this shop. Here's what you would see. What would you do? Or here's our idea. Imagine you are a empty nester and you live your life devoid of good food and wine, but now we have a new club. Uh, what do you think of that? And basically, it's very similar to software development. They have this idea of these kind of agile methods, sprints, where you come up with a, a plan, you design something, you build it, you kind of get feedback on it, you release it, and then you do the same thing again. And in software development nowadays, those kind of sprints can be a couple of weeks, six weeks maybe. In the old days, these kind of phases used to go like six months or a year. You'd get all the requirements, you'd spend months and months building it, then you'd release it after six months and you'd wait for feedback and six months later you'd ne the next version would come out. Now you do these very tight iterations and that's kind of the goal of this process as well, is to kind of get feedback as quickly as possible. Um, I'm not going to show that video, but build prototypes come up with some kind of a mechanism. We may even have time to have you guys come up with a concept mechanism right now and get some feedback from the other groups. Maybe we'll try that. But basically, it just has to be a description of what it is that your business might be. Uh, and then once you've built it, like a prototype of it or a description of it, you then go out and evaluate it. And I'm just going to say a little bit about that. The three things you want to keep in mind when you're evaluating your concept. So let's say you explain your business idea to a, a potential customer. You, want, you tell them, I want to just find out a couple things from you. I want general feedback. Most importantly, I want to know what do you think is great about the idea? What do you think is not quite right? And what do you think, if you could add one more thing, what would that one more thing be? And if you could just get those three bits of information from 10 people, let's say, it's amazing how much better your idea can become. You just ask those three things, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend three minutes pitching to you an idea. Then I want you to just spend one minute telling me what's great, what's not quite right. And if you could add one more thing, what would it be? And if you just do that, in fact, we could try it tonight. You'll be surprised if you just pitch your idea to the next table over and they give you feedback on those three things. You then incorporate that feedback quickly and pitch the idea to the next table. If you just did that, for each of the other tables, at the end of that, you'd have a much stronger idea. And that's kind of the idea in the customer discovery process. You want to go out and start pitching the idea to people and incorporating their feedback. Does that make sense? Should we try it? I think we actually have time to try it. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, let's, 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 uh, I won't go to repeat. Let's do this. Let's try this. So 
what I want is, how are we gonna do this? I guess we're gonna have to split the tables up. So like two people from each table go to the next table. Should we go clockwise or counterclockwise? Who votes clockwise? Oh, who votes counterclockwise? Oh, okay, I guess the clockwise is win. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so two people from each table go clockwise like that to the next table and just pitch your idea to them. People at the table, you are, you are there as potential customers. So I guess, the, I guess we'll make this a little more structured. So let's say two of you will come over here and you'll explain that your target customers are this type of person. So that's what you want all of them to pretend to be. So all of you have to pretend that you are empty nesters. Your kids have gone off to college. You now have a bit more money, a bit more time and they have a, an idea that they're gonna to pitch to you, all right? So two people from each table rotate to the next table and they are pitching the idea to the next table. So bring some post-its if you want. All right, here it is. If you don't have an idea, that's okay. Pitch the rough space. All right, so two of you go there. <laughs> oh wait, did you guys rotate already? No, we need to just get our idea. Oh. 10, 10 okay. Okay. Sorry. Spend spend a minute or two coming up with your your pitch that you're going to make to the next table. All right. So now remember, you you have you have a couple of minutes to chat. But what you really want to do is after you've pitched your idea, you want to get from the audience what they think was great about the idea, what was not quite great, and if they could add one more thing, what would it be? I'm gonna wrap it up now and have you rotate one more time just to see how the feedback works. So you can actually, if you want on the fly, incorporate what you heard from the other, from the first team. Like if they had, if they had a one more thing or something that they thought was not quite right, you're gonna just on the fly incorporate that and rotate one more time and pitch your idea again to another table. Does that make sense? Yeah. So two people from each table rotating to the right twice, or rotating clockwise twice. Now that you're done, finishing up, good. Uh, oh, okay, so now I'm just gonna finish the whole climber thing. So we talked about customers, we built up some profiles, we understood how they lead their life. You guys had some nice insights. We didn't spend much time on this phase. Uh, usually when I'm running this whole thing, I go through different brainstorming techniques, problem mapping techniques, change mapping techniques, etc. But we, you guys did, you got there anyway. It sounds like there's some cool concepts. Came up with some ideas of mechanisms that could actually do it. Maybe it's a website, maybe it's a club, whatever it might be. We should have built it, but instead you used language to kind of build it in the mind of someone else. You evaluated it. And the only thing I was gonna mention here is that Usually in design thinking, you then want to repeat the process. And it could be, it's not like repeat necessarily to just change your prototype. It may actually sometimes be that when you repeat, you go all the way back to the beginning again. And you realize that there's a whole other consumer group that you should have been targeting, or there's a different aspect of their life that's important. So that's the basic idea. Now that you got to go around and sort of repeat twice or iterate your prototype twice, I'm hoping you have some good ideas. So I know we only have 10 minutes left. So if you could, if the two people who went around to the tables could come back to the home group and spend like a minute incorporating what you found out with that group. And I'm going to ask each group to then do like a one minute pitch of the idea and you'll pitch it to the camera. So you'll have a little microphone thing that you'll be holding. Uh, but let me just, one thing I wanted to mention about this is, uh, oops, sorry, oops, this. Final pitch, so this whole climber model, it actually works really well for also pitching an idea. So if you have to do an elevator pitch or go to a business competition, think about crafting your presentation like the climber model. So, you know, you start by describing who your customer is and how they lead their life. So, you know, our customer is uh, stay-at-home moms who, I forget what the group had, uh, stay-at-home moms. Uh, and one of their big issues is, I'm not gonna go through what it is because you guys will get to hear it in a minute. Uh, we had this insight that if we could just find a way for them to, whatever it might be, we thought a good way to do this would be if we could create a system that let them, I don't know what it is. Uh, anyway, so if you go through and explain your concept that way in the kind of last minute, that would be great. So 
the scouts who went out and pitched the idea, everyone go back to your original groups, spend a minute or two talking about sort of how you could pitch this as a one minute elevator pitch where you talk about who your customer is, some aspect of their life, what your insight is, and how your business proposition might move forward. Also, if you can, highlight how, and as we were talking with our customers, I know it's other teams, one of the good ideas they had was to incorporate something like this. So you don't have to necessarily talk about some idea that you got, but if there was something kind of cool that someone mentioned in your feedback, talk about how it changed your thinking. Any questions? All right, we're almost done. Just assemble a quick 30 second pitch and then we'll go around. Anything major come of it, go. Everyone ready to pitch their ideas? Should we have teams come up to the front and pitch or do you wanna just pitch from your table? You'll go first? Okay, good, wait, hold on. This just has to be sort of near you. You can just kind of hold it face-ish zone. You don't have to speak right into it, but just nearby. Is All right, going? here comes business concept one. Da, 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 da. Okay. So we are pitching the idea of a board activities program that is required nationwide in elementary schools as well as middle schools. Um, it is very crucial that kids are getting that like one-on-one -on -one experience with somebody or a group of people where they are um, continuing to learn how to hold a conversation with someone as well as other basic like human skills that they're going to need later in their life. like. Um, like patience, you know, having a concept of time, which you need that in most um, board games or card games. Um, we focus on um, kids that come from low income houses because a lot of the time there are some kids that just don't get to have that experience in their houses. Um, they grow up with parents that have to work a ton or they can't afford different games. And so making sure that um, they have those opportunities and that those skills are kind of, you know, being um, brought up to them um, is also very crucial and we also discussed um, having like a requirement so it's required that they get a certain amount of hours like within this time frame of their elementary and middle school um, lives and that there's kind of like different levels of each to make sure that improvement is happening and they're not just going and kind of showing up they're actually getting something out of it so cool well done nice job yay Awesome. All right. Uh, I guess we'll just go around the room. You guys ready to pitch something? I guess we're ready. All right. Let's hear it. You just hold that roughly near you. I guess you want to come to this side just so camera and everyone can see you or rotate either way. All right. So we're pitching. Uh, so our, our uh, target group audience um, is 50 to 65 year old parents um, whose kids have left for college. Um, so they're empty nesters and they need something to do with their time and their um, extra disposable income. Um, and they want something adventurous. They want to experience things. They like experiencing um, food and alcohol and uh, different, different uh, skills and hobbies. So um, we thought of combining a um, painting bar where people come together to paint a simple picture and like learn the process and their social and we're combining that with um, food and wine pairings and tastings and all sorts of cocktails and things like that so a way to incorporate those two maybe not at the same time but in some sort of activity um, which would allow older couples to meet other couples and people and um, explore their hobbies and um, you know uh, drink a lot of food and wine and the food and wine would be offered by in big cities by restaurants that want to try things out um, and so they can try them out at this location anonymously rather than um, putting them in their own restaurant so they get to kind of experiment and get feedback without um, all the pressure of putting in the restaurant so that's where the food and wine part of it would come in so that's what we got nice cool sounds good well done yay good job all right uh, I guess you guys all right Pat we had Matt now we have Pat I guess, yeah, maybe here is good. And hold this, I guess, like that, something like that. <laughs> nice. um, so we had a, um, our audience is high school seniors, um, student athletes. Um, and so we decided to design a social media platform that um, can connect student athletes to colleges and coaches to student athletes. Um, the matching system, the student will go through and um, pick interests that they want in a college, like size, location, um, academic interests, um, whether they want division one, two, three, um, 
And then the program will also have um, coaches pick the student athlete that they want, the skill level, the the G, like above a G, certain GPA. Um, and it also there's also the ability to chat with current student athletes at that school to see like the reality of the school. Um, some sort of regulation system that the coach can't hype the school up too much, but um, the student athletes are also pretty honest with that. Um, and sort of like a, a rate my professor type thing where it's like a rate my coach and they get to see the weak points and the strong points of each program in school. Um, and yeah, so it'd be a, a really good way for student athletes to research um, the programs they want and for coaches to connect with student athletes. Nice, sounds good. Yay, yay, yay. Good thanks, thanks. All right, and uh, last but not least. All righty, so our group decided to target the middle-aged stay-home mom um, who has a lot of time on her hands. She cares a lot about her kids, um, but when her kids are off at school and her husband's off at work, she kind of finds herself um, wondering what she should do during the day. So we came up with the idea of a social um, platform that connects stay-at-home moms with other uh, mothers in her same situation. So when she signs up for the app, she inputs activities that she likes to do. Um, and after she connects with a similar stay-at-home mom, they can communicate on the app, and um, the app will give them suggestions on some events that are going on in the area, um, say during that week, um, that they might be interested in. So it not only helps connect other uh, mothers in the same situation, but gives them ideas uh, for things that they can do to kind of kick off a new friendship. Nice, awesome, sounds good, yay! Well done, stay-at-home moms. <laughs> all right, good job. So in the final 30 seconds, I just want to point out, you, A, you all did awesome work, great job, nice ideas here, something worth considering. Um, you should, I, I hope that you saw how just by two little cycles around the room, it, you got some pretty good feedback, you managed to make your ideas a bit stronger. Um, if you wanted to go to the next stage, you'd do more of this kind of customer discovery. You'd spend time actually coming up with interview guides and going and interviewing the right people. You'd come up with questionnaires that you could distribute online. You could do it uh, through all kinds of different mechanisms out there. And you'd get much more data to keep enriching your ideas. And that's kind of what's important is to make sure that you have a clear set of target consumers that you've really come to understand and you have data to support your assumptions that your hypotheses about what they might pay for are accurate, and that you really have kind of evolved a concept that is delicious to them. Does that make sense? All right, I have nothing else. I'll be around for a few minutes if anyone wants to chat. Otherwise, thanks so much for coming. <laughs>